Chapter Thirty Six. As soon as we reckoned everybody was asleep that night, we went down the lightning rod and shut ourselves up in the lean-to and got out our pile of fox fire and went to work. We cleared everything out of the way, about four or five foot along the middle of the bottom log. Tom said we was right behind Jim's bed now, and we'd dig in under it. And when we got through there, couldn't nobody in the cabin ever know there was any hole there, because Jim's counterpin hung down most to the ground, and you'd have to raise it up and look under to see the hole. So we dug and dug with the case knives till most midnight, and then we was dog tired and our hands was blistered, and yet you couldn't see we'd done hardly anything. At last I says, "This ain't no thirty-seven year job." This is a thirty-eight year job, Tom Sawyer. He never said nothing, but he sighed, and pretty soon he stopped digging, and then for a good little while I knowed that he was thinking. Then he says, "It ain't no use, Huck. It ain't a goin' to work. If we was prisoners, it would, because then we'd have as many years as we wanted, and no hurry, and we couldn't get but a few minutes to dig every day while they was changin' watches." And so our hands wouldn't get blistered, and we could keep it up right along, year in and year out, and do it right and the way it ought to be done. But we can't fool along. We got to rush. We ain't got no time to spare. If we was to put in another night this way, we'd have to knock off for a week to let our hands get well. Couldn't touch a case knife with them sooner. Well, then what we going to do, Tom? I'll tell you, it ain't right and it ain't moral, and I wouldn't like it to get out. But there ain't only just the one way. We got to dig him out with the picks and let on its case knives. Now you're talking, I says. Your head gets leveler and leveler all the time, Tom Sawyer. I says. Picks is the thing, moral or no moral. And as for me, I don't care shucks for the morality of it, nohow. When I start in to steal a nigger or a watermelon or a Sunday school book. I ain't no ways particular how it's done, so it's done. What I want is my nigger, or what I want is my watermelon, or what I want is my Sunday school book. And if a pick's the handiest thing, that's the thing I'm a going to dig that nigger or that watermelon or that Sunday school book out with. And I don't give a dead rat what the authorities thinks about it, nuther. Well, he says, there's excuse for picks and letting on in a case like this. If it weren't so, I wouldn't approve of it, nor I wouldn't stand by and see the rules broke, because right is right and wrong is wrong, and a body ain't got no business doing wrong when he ain't ignorant and knows better. It might answer for you to dig Jim out with a pick without any letting on, because you don't know no better, but it wouldn't for me because I do know better. Give me a case knife. He had his own by him, but I handed him mine. He flung it down and says, "Give me a case knife." I didn't know just what to do, but then I thought. I scratched around amongst the old tools and got a pickaxe and give it to him, and he took it and went to work and never said a word. He was always just that particular, full of principle. So then I got a shovel, and we picked and shoveled, turned about, and made the fur fly. We stuck to it about a half an hour, which is as long as we could stand up, but we had a good deal of a hole to show for it. When I got upstairs, I looked out at the window and see Tom doing his level best with the lightning rod, but he couldn't come it. His hands was so sore. At last, he says, "It ain't no use. It can't be done. What you reckon I better do? Can't you think of no way?" "Yes," I says, "but I reckon it ain't regular." Come up the stairs and let on it's a lightning rod. So he done it. Next day, Tom stole a pewter spoon and a brass candlestick in the house, for to make some pens for Jim out of, and six tallow candles. And I hung around the nigger cabins and laid for a chance, and stole three tin plates. Tom says it wasn't enough, but I said nobody wouldn't ever see the plates that Jim throwed out. Because they'd fall in the dog fennel and jimson weeds under the window hole, then we could tote them back and he could use them over again. So Tom was satisfied. Then he says, "Now the thing to study out is 
How to get the things to Jim? Take them in through the hole, I says, when we get it done. He only just looked scornful and said something about nobody ever heard of such an idiotic idea, and then he went to studying. By and by he said he had ciphered out two or three ways, but there weren't no need to decide on any of them yet. Said we'd got to post Jim first. That night we went down the lightning rod a little after ten and took one of the candles along and listened under the window hole and heard Jim snoring. So we pitched it in and it didn't wake him. Then we whirled in with the pick and shovel and in about two hours and a half the job was done. We crept in under Jim's bed and into the cabin and pawed around and found the candle and lit it and stood over Jim a while and found him looking hearty and healthy. And then we woke him up gentle and gradual. He was so glad to see us, he most cried and called us honey and all the pet names he could think of and was for having us hunt up a cold chisel to cut the chain off of his leg with right away and clearing out without losing any time. But Tom, he showed him how unregular it would be, and sat down and told him all about our plans, and how we could alter them in a minute any time there was an alarm, and not to be the least afraid, because we would see he got away, sure. So Jim, he said it was all right, and we sat there and talked over old times a while. And then Tom asked a lot of questions, and when Jim told him Uncle Silas come in every day or two to pray with him, and Aunt Sally come in to see if he was comfortable and had plenty to eat, and both of them was as kind as they could be, Tom says, Now I know how to fix it. We'll send you some things by them. I said, Don't do nothing of the kind. It's one of the most jackass ideas I ever struck. But he paid no attention to me, went right on. It was his way when he'd got his plan set. So he told Jim how we'd have to smuggle in the rope ladder pie and other large things by Nat, the nigger that fed him, and he must be on the lookout and not be surprised, and not let Nat see him open them, and we would put small things in Uncle's coat pockets, and he must steal them out, and we would tie things to Aunt's apron springs, or put them in her apron pocket if we got a chance, and told him what they would be and what they was for and told him how to keep a journal on the shirt with his blood and all that. He told him everything. Jim, he couldn't see no sense in the most of it, but he allowed we was white folks, and knowed better than him. So he was satisfied, and said he would do it all, just as Tom said. Jim had plenty corn cob pipes and tobacco, so we had a right down good sociable time. Then we crawled out through the hole, and so home to bed with hands that looked like they'd been chawed. Tom was in high spirits. He said it was the best fun he ever had in his life, and the most intellectual, and said if he only could see his way to it, we would keep it up all the rest of our lives, and leave Jim to our children to get out, for he believed Jim would come to like it better and better the more he got used to it. He said that in that way it could be strung out to as much as eighty year, and would be the best time on record and he said it would make us all celebrated that had a hand in it. In the morning, we went out to the woodpile and chopped up the brass candlestick into handy sizes, and Tom put them and the pewter spoon in his pocket. Then we went to the nigger cabins, and while I got Nat's notice off, Tom shoved a piece of candlestick into the middle of a corn pone that was in Jim's pan, and we went along with Nat to see how it would work, and it just worked noble. When Jim bit into it, it most mashed all his teeth out, and there weren't ever anything could have worked better. Tom said so himself. Jim, he never let on, but what it was only just a piece of rock or something like that that's always getting into bread, you know. But after that, he never bit into nothing but what he jabbed his fork into it in three or four places first. And whilst we was a-standin' there in the dimish light, here comes a couple of the hounds, bulging in from under Jim's bed, and they kept on piling in till there was eleven of them, and there weren't hardly room in there to get your breath. By jings, we forgot to fasten that lean-to door. The nigger Nat, he only just hollered, Witches! once, and keeled over onto the floor amongst the dogs, and begun to groan like he was dying. Tom jerked the door open and flung out a slab of Jim's meat, and the dogs went for it 
"'and in two seconds he was out himself and back again and shut the door, "'and I knowed he'd fix the other door, too. "'Then he went to work on the nigger, "'coaxing him and petting him and asking him "'if he'd been imagining he saw something. "'He raised up and blinked his eyes around and says, "'Mars Sid, you'll say I's a fool, "'but if I didn't believe I seen most a million dogs "'or devils or summon, "'I wished I made that right here in these tracks.' "'I did, most surely. "'Ma said, I felt em. "'I felt em, sir. "'They was all over me. "'They had to fetch it. "'I just wish I could get my hands on one of them witches just once. "'Only just once. "'It's all I'd asked. "'But mostly I wish they'd let me alone, I does.' "'Tom says, "'Well, I tell you what I think. "'What makes them come here, "'just at this runaway nigger's breakfast time?' "'It's because they're hungry. That's the reason. "'You make them a witch pie. That's the thing for you to do.' "'But, my lamb, Marcid, how's I going to make em a witch pie? "'I don't know how to make it. I hain't ever heard of such a thing before. "'Well, then I'll have to make it myself. "'Will you do it, honey? Will you? "'I'll wish up the ground under your foot, I will.' "'All right, I'll do it, seein' it's you, and you've been good to us and showed us the runaway nigger. "'But you got to be mighty careful. "'When we come around, you turn your back, and then whatever we've put in the pan, "'don't you let on you see it at all. "'And don't you look when Jim unloads the pan. "'Something might happen, I don't know what. "'And above all, don't you handle the witch things.' "'Handle him, Marcid? What is you a-talkin' about?' I wouldn't lay the weight of my finger on em. Not for ten hundred thousand billion dollars, I wouldn't. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 That was all fixed. So then we went away and went to the rubbish pile in the backyard, where they keep the old boots and rags and pieces of bottles and wore out tin things and all such truck, "'and scratched around and found an old tin washpan "'and stopped up the holes as well as we could "'to bake the pie in "'and took it down cellar and stole it full of flour "'and started for breakfast "'and found a couple of shingle nails "'that Tom said would be handy for a prisoner "'to scrabble his name and sorrows on the dungeon walls with "'and dropped one of them in Aunt Sally's apron pocket "'which was hanging on a chair "'and the other we stuck in the band of Uncle Silas's hat "'which was on the bureau "'because we heard the children say their pa and ma "'was going to the runaway nigger's house this morning "'and then went to breakfast. "'And Tom dropped the pewter spoon in Uncle Silas's coat pocket, "'and Aunt Sally wasn't come yet, "'so we had to wait a little while. "'And when she come, she was hot and red and cross "'and couldn't hardly wait for the blessing. "'And then she went to sluicing out coffee with one hand "'and cracking the handiest child's head with her thimble with the other, "'and says... "'I've hunted high and I've hunted low, "'and it does beat all what has become of your other shirt. "'My heart fell down amongst my lungs and livers and things, "'and a hard piece of corn crust started down my throat after it "'and got me on the road with a cough "'and was shot across the table "'and took one of the children in the eye "'and curled him up like a fishing worm "'and let a cry out of him the size of a war whoop. "'And Tom, he turned kind of blue around the gills, "'and it all amounted to a considerable state of things "'for about a quarter of a minute, or as much as that, "'and I would have sold out for half price if there was a bidder. "'But after that, we was all right again. "'It was the sudden surprise of it that knocked us kind of cold. "'Uncle Silas, he says, "'It's most uncommon curious. I can't understand it. "'I know perfectly well I took it off, because... "'Because you hain't got but one on. "'Just listen at the man.' I know you took it off, and know it by a better way than your wool-gathering memory, too, because it was on the clothesline yesterday. I see it there myself. But it's gone. That's the long and short of it. And you'll just have to change to a red flannel one till I can get time to make a new one. And it'll be the third one I've made in two years. It just keeps a body on the jump to keep you in shirts, and whatever you do manage to do with them all is more than I can make out. A body think you would learn to take some sort of care of em at your time of life. I know it, Sally. I do try all I can. But it oughtn't to be altogether my fault. Because, you know, I don't see them, nor have nothing to do with them except when they're on me. 
"'and I don't believe I've ever lost one of them off of me.' "'Well, it ain't your fault if you haven't, Silas. "'You'd have done it if you could, I reckon. "'And the shirt ain't all that's gone, nother. "'There's a spoon gone, and that ain't all. "'There was ten, and now there's only nine. "'The calf got the shirt, I reckon. "'But the calf never took the spoon, that's certain. "'Why, what else is gone, Sally?' "'There's six candles gone, that's what. "'The rats could have got the candles, and I reckon they did. "'I wonder they don't walk off of the whole place, "'the way you're always going to stop their holes and don't do it. "'And if they weren't fools, they'd sleep in your hair, Silas. "'You'd never find it out. "'But you can't lay the spoon on the rats, and that I know. "'Well, Sally, I'm in fault, and I acknowledge it. "'I've been remiss, but I won't let tomorrow go by "'without stopping up them holes.' Oh, I wouldn't hurry. Next year'll do. Matilda Angelina Araminta Phelps. Whack comes the thimble, and the child snatches her claws out of the sugar bowl without fooling around any. Just then, the nigger woman steps on to the passage and says, "Missus, day's a sheet gone." A sheet gone? Well, for the land's sake! I'll stop up them holes today," says Uncle Silas, looking sorrowful. Oh, do shut up! Suppose the rats took the sheet. Where's it gone, Lies? Clyde, of goodness, I hain't no notion, Miss Sally. She was on the clothesline yesterday, but she done gone. She ain't there no more now. I reckon the world is coming to an end. I never see the beat of it in all my born days. A shirt and a sheet and a spoon and six can't missus. Comes a young yaller wench. Days a breast candlestick missin. Clear out from here, you hussy, or I'll take a skillet to ye. Well, she was just a bilin. I begun to lay for a chance. I reckoned I would sneak out and go for the woods till the weather moderated. She kept a ragin' right along, runnin' her insurrection all by herself, and everybody else mighty meek and quiet. And at last, Uncle Silas, lookin' kind of foolish, fishes up that spoon out of his pocket. She stopped with her mouth open and her hands up, and as for me, I wished I was in Jerusalem or somewheres, but not long because she says, "It's just as I expected." So you had it in your pocket all the time, and like as not you've got the other things there too. How did it get there? I really don't know, Sally," he says, kind of apologizing, "or you know I would tell." I was a studyin' over my text in Acts seventeen before breakfast, and I reckon I put it in there, not noticin', meanin' to put my testament in, and it must be so because my testament ain't in. But I'll go and see, and if the testament is where I had it, I'll know I didn't put it in, and that will show that I laid the testament down and took up the spoon. And oh, for the land's sake, give a body a rest! Go long now, the whole kit and bilin' of ye, and don't come nigh me again till I've got back my peace of mind. I'd a heard her if she'd a said it to herself, let alone speaking it out, and I'd a got up and obeyed her if I'd a been dead. As we was passin' through the settin' room, the old man he took up his hat, and the shingle nail fell out on the floor, and he just merely picked it up and laid it on the mantel shelf, and never said nothin', and went out. Tom see him do it and remembered about the spoon and says, "Well, it ain't no use to send things by him no more. He ain't reliable." Then he says, "But he done us a good turn with the spoon anyhow, without knowing it, and so we'll go and do him one without him knowing it. Stop up his rat holes." There was a noble good lot of them down cellar, and it took us a whole hour, but we done the job tight and good and ship shape. Then we heard steps on the stairs. And blowed out our light and hid, and here comes the old man with a candle in one hand and a bundle of stuff in the other, looking as absent-minded as year before last. He went to moonin' around first to one rat hole and then another till he'd been to them all. Then he stood about five minutes, pickin' tallow drip off of his candle and thinkin'. Then he turns off slow and dreamy towards the stairs, sayin', "Well, for the laugh of me, I can't remember when I done it." I could show her now that I warn't to blame on account of the rats, but never mind, let it go. I reckon it wouldn't do no good. And so he went on a mumbling upstairs, and then we left. He was a mighty nice old man, and always is. 
Tom was a good deal bothered about what to do for a spoon, but he said we'd got to have it, so he took a think. When he had ciphered it out, he told me how we was to do. Then we went and waited around the spoon basket till we see Aunt Sally coming, and then Tom went to counting the spoons and laying them out to one side, and I slid one of them up my sleeve. And Tom says, Why, Aunt Sally, there ain't but nine spoons yet. She says, Go along to your play and don't bother me. I know better. I counted them myself. Well, I've counted them twice, Auntie, and I can't make but nine. She looked out of all patience, but of course she come to count. Anybody would. I declare to gracious there ain't but nine, she says. Why, what in the world? Plague, take the things. I'll count them again. So I slipped back the one I had. When she got done counting, she says, Hang the troublesome rubbish. There's ten now. And she looked huffy and bothered both. But Tom says, Why, Auntie, I don't think there's ten. You numbskull, didn't you see me count em? I know, but, well, I'll count em again. So I smouched one, and they come out nine, same as the other time. Well, she was in a tearin' way, just a-tremblin' all over she was so mad. But she counted and counted till she got that addled, she'd start to count in a basket for a spoon sometimes. And so, three times they come out right, and three times they come out wrong. Then she grabbed up the basket and slammed it across the house, and knocked the cat galley west. And she said, clear her out and let her have some peace. And if we came bothering her again betwixt that and dinner, she'd skin us. So we had the odd spoon, and dropped it in her apron pocket while she was a givin' us our sailin' orders. And Jim got it all right, along with her shingle nail, before noon. We was very well satisfied with this business, and Tom allowed it was worth twice the trouble it took, because he said now she couldn't ever count them spoons twice alike again to save her life, and wouldn't believe she'd count them right if she did, and said that after she'd about counted her head off for the next three days, he judged she'd give it up and offer to kill anybody that wanted her to ever count them any more. So we put the sheet back on the line that night, and stole one out of her closet, and kept on putting it back and stealing it again for a couple of days, till she didn't know how many sheets she had any more, and she didn't care, and weren't a-going to bully-rag the rest of her soul out about it, and wouldn't count them again not to save her life. She'd druther die first. So we was all right now. As to the shirt and the sheet, and the spoon and the candles, by the help of the calf and the rats and the mixed-up counting, and as to the candlestick, it weren't no consequence. It would blow over by and by. But that pie was a job. We had no end of trouble with that pie. We fixed it up away down in the woods and cooked it there, and we got it done at last, and very satisfactory, too, but not all in one day, and we had to use up three wash pans full of flour before we got through, and we got burnt pretty much all over in places and eyes put out with the smoke because, you see, we didn't want nothing but a crust, and we couldn't prop it up right, and she would always cave in. But, of course, we thought of the right way at last, which was to cook the latter, too, in the pie. So then we laid in with Jim the second night, and tore up the sheet all in little strings and twisted them together, and long before daylight we had a lovely rope that you could have hung a person with. We let on it took nine months to make it. And in the forenoon we took it down to the woods, but it wouldn't go into the pie. Being made of a whole sheet that way, there was rope enough for forty pies if we'd a wanted them, and plenty left over for soup or sausage or anything you choose. We could a had a whole dinner. But we didn't need it. All we needed was just enough for the pie, and so we throwed the rest away. We didn't cook none of the pies in the wash pan, afraid the solder would melt. But Uncle Silas, he had a noble brass warming pan, which he thought considerable of, because it belonged to one of his ancestors with a long wooden handle, that come over from England with William the Conqueror in the Mayflower, or one of them early ships, and was hid away up garret with a lot of other old pots and things that was valuable, not on account of being any account, because they weren't, but on account of them being relics, you know. And we snaked her out private, and took her down there, but she failed on the first pies, because we didn't know how. But she come up smiling on the last one, 
"'We took and lined her with dough and set her in the coals "'and loaded her up with rag rope "'and put on a dough roof and shut down the lid "'and put hot embers on top "'and stood off five foot with the long handle, cool and comfortable. "'And in fifteen minutes she turned out a pie "'that was a satisfaction to look at. "'But the person that ate it would want to fetch a couple of kags of toothpicks along, "'for if that rope ladder wouldn't cramp him down to business, "'I don't know nothing what I'm talking about.' "'and lay him in enough stomach-ache to last him till next time, too. "'Nat didn't look when we put the witch pie in Jim's pan, "'and we put the three tin plates in the bottom of the pan under the vittles, "'and so Jim got everything all right, "'and as soon as he was by himself he busted into the pie "'and hid the rope ladder inside of his straw tick "'and scratched some marks on a tin plate "'and throwed it out of the window hole.' End of chapter 37 Chapter 38 Making them pens was a distressed tough job, and so was the saw, and Jim allowed the inscription was going to be the toughest of all. That's the one which a prisoner has to scrabble on the wall. But he had to have it. Tom said he'd got to. There weren't no case of a state prisoner not scrabbling his inscription to leave behind, and his coat of arms. "'Look at Lady Jane Grey,' he says. "'Look at Guilford Dudley. Look at old Northumberland. Why, Huck, suppose it is considerable trouble. What you going to do? How you going to get around it? Jim's got to do his inscription and coat of arms. They all do.' Jim says, "'Why, Mars Tom, I hain't got no coat of arm.' I ain't got nothing but dish year old shirt, and you knows I got to keep the journal on dat. Oh, you don't understand, Jim. A coat of arms is very different. Well, I says, Jim's right anyway when he says he ain't got no coat of arms, because he hain't. I reckon I know that, Tom says, but you bet he'll have one before he gets out of this, because he's going out right, and there ain't going to be no flaws in his record. So, whilst me and Jim filed away at the pens on a brick bat apiece, Jim a-making his'n out of the brass, and I'm making mine out of the spoon, Tom set to work to think out the coat of arms. By and by, he said he'd struck so many good ones, he didn't hardly know which to take, but there was one which he reckoned he'd decide on. He says, On the sketchin', we'll have a bend, or in the dexter base, a saltire murray in the fess with a dog, Couchant for common charge, and under his foot a chain embattled for slavery, with a chevron vert and a chief engrailed, and three invected lines on a field azure, with the nombral points rampant on a dancet indented, crest a runaway nigger, sable with his bundle over his shoulder on a bar sinister, and a couple of ghouls for supporters, which is you and me, motto. Magiora fretta minora auto got it out of a book means the more haste the less speed gee willikins i says but what does the rest of it mean we ain't got no time to bother over that he says we got to dig in like all get out well anyway i says what's some of it what's a fess a fess a fess is "'You don't need to know what a fess is. "'I'll show him how to make it when he gets to it.' "'Shucks, Tom,' I says. "'I think you might tell a person. "'What's a bar sinister?' "'Oh, I don't know, but he's got to have it. "'All the nobility does.' "'That was just his way. "'If it didn't suit him to explain a thing to you, "'he wouldn't do it. "'You might pump at him a week. "'It wouldn't make no difference.' He'd got all that coat of arms business fixed, so now he started in to finish up the rest of that part of the work, which was to plan out a mournful inscription. Said Jim got to have one, like they all done. He made up a lot, and wrote them out on a paper and read them off so. 1. Here a captive heart busted. 2. Here a poor prisoner, forsook by the world and friends, fretted his sorrowful life. 3. Here a lonely heart broke, and a worn spirit went to its rest after thirty-seven years of solitary captivity. 4. Here, homeless and friendless, after thirty-seven years of bitter captivity, 
perished a noble stranger, natural son of Louis fourteen. Tom's voice trembled whilst he was reading them, and he most broke down. When he got done, he couldn't no way make up his mind which one for Jim to scrabble onto the wall. They was all so good. But at last, he allowed he would let him scrabble them all on. Jim said it would take him a year to scrabble such a lot of truck on to the logs with a nail, and he didn't know how to make letters besides. But Tom said he would block them out for him, and then he wouldn't have nothing to do but just follow the lines. Then, pretty soon he says, Come to think, the logs ain't a-going to do. They don't have log walls in a dungeon. We got to dig the inscriptions into a rock. We'll fetch a rock. Jim said the rock was worse than the logs. He said it would take him such a pissin' long time to dig them into a rock, he wouldn't ever get out. But Tom said he would let me help him do it. Then he took a look to see how me and Jim was getting along with the pens. It was most pesky tedious hard work and slow, and didn't give my hands no show to get well of the sores, and we didn't seem to make no headway hardly. So Tom says, I know how to fix it. We got to have a rock for the coat of arms and mournful inscriptions, and we can kill two birds with that same rock. There's a gaudy big grindstone down at the mill, and we'll smouch it and carve the things on it and file out the pens and the saw on it, too. It warn't no slouch of an idea, and it warn't no slouch of a grindstone, nother, but we'd allowed we'd tackle it. It warn't quite midnight yet, so we cleared out for the mill, leaving Jim at work. We smouched the grindstone, and set out to roll her home, but it was a most nation-tough job. Sometimes, do what we could, we couldn't keep her from falling over, and she come mighty near mashing us every time. Tom said she was going to get one of us, sure, before we got through. We got her halfway, and then we was plumb played out, and most drowned with sweat. We see it warn't no use. We got to go and fetch Jim. So he raised up his bed, and slid the chain off of the bed leg, and wrapped it around and round his neck, and we crawled out through our hole and down there, and Jim and me laid into that grindstone and walked her along like nothing, and Tom superintended. He could out-superintend any boy I ever see. He knowed how to do everything. Our hole was pretty big, but it warn't big enough to get the grindstone through. But Jim, he took the pick and soon made it big enough. Then Tom marked out them things in it with a nail and set Jim to work on them, with the nail for a chisel and an iron bolt from the rubbish in the lean-to for a hammer, and told him to work till the rest of his candle quit on him, and then he could go to bed, and hide the grindstone under his straw tick, and sleep on it. Then we helped him fix his chain back on the bed leg, and was ready for bed ourselves. But Tom thought of something, and says, You got any spiders in here, Jim? No, sir, thanks to goodness I hate Mars Tom. All right, we'll get you some. But bless you, honey, I don't want none. I's a fear to them. I just as soon have rattlesnakes around. Tom thought a minute or two and says, It's a good idea, and I reckon it's been done. It must have been done, it stands to reason. Yes, it's a prime good idea. Where could you keep it? Keep what, Mars Tom? Why, a rattlesnake. To goodness gracious alive, Mars Tom. Why, if dey was a rattlesnake to come in here, I'd take and bust right out through dat log wall I would, with my head. Why, Jim, you wouldn't be afraid of it after a little. You could tame it. Tame it? Yes, easy enough. Every animal is grateful for kindness and petting, and they wouldn't think of hurting a person that pets them. Any book will tell you that. You try. That's all I ask. Just try for two or three days. Why, you can get him so in a little while that he'll love you and sleep with you and won't stay away from you a minute and will let you wrap him round your neck and put his head in your mouth. Please, Mars Tom, don't talk so. I can't stand it. He let me shove his head in my mouth for a favor, ain't it? I lay he'd wait a powerful long time for I asked him. And mo and dat, I don't want him to sleep with me. Jim, don't act so foolish. A prisoner's got to have some kind of a dumb pet, and if a rattlesnake ain't ever been tried, why, there's more glory to be gained in your being the first to ever try it than any other way you could ever think of to save your life. Why, Mars Tom, I don't want no such glory. 
Snake taken by Jim's chin off. Then what is the glory? No, sir, I don't want no such doings. Blame it, can't you try? I only want you to try. You needn't keep it up if it don't work. But to trouble all done, if the snake bite me while I's a trying him. Mars Tom, I's willing to tackle most anything that ain't unreasonable, but if you and Huck fetches a rattlesnake in here for me to tame, I's gwan to leave, that's sure. Well, then let it go. Let it go if you're so bull-headed about it. We can get you some garter snakes, and you can tie some buttons on their tails and let on the rattlesnakes, and I reckon that'll have to do. I can stand them, Mars Tom, but blame if I couldn't get along without em, I tell you that. I never know before twas so much bother and trouble to be a prisoner. Well, it always is when it's done right. You got any rats round here? No, sir, I ain't seed none. Well, we'll get you some rats. Why, Mars Tom, I don't want no rats. There's the dab blamedest creatures disturb a body and rustle round over him and bite his feet when he's trying to sleep. I ever see. No, sir, give me garter snakes if I's got to have em, but don't give me no rats. I ain't got no use for em, scarcely. But, Jim, you got to have em, they all do, so don't make no more fuss about it. Prisoners ain't ever without rats. There ain't no instance of it. And they train them and pet them and learn them tricks, and they get to be as sociable as flies. But you got to play music to them. You got anything to play music on? I ain't got nothing but a coast comb and a piece of paper and a juice harp, but I reckon they wouldn't take no such stock in a juice harp. Yes, they would. They don't care what kind of music tis. A juice harp's plenty good enough for a rat. All animals like music. In a prison, they dote on it. "'especially painful music, "'and you can't get no other kind out of a Jew's harp. "'It always interests them. "'They come out to see what's the matter with you. "'Yes, you're all right. "'You're fixed very well. "'You want to sit on your bed nights before you go to sleep "'and early in the mornings and play your Jew's harp. "'Play The Last Link is Broken. "'That's the thing that'll scoop a rat quicker than anything else. "'When you've played about two minutes, "'you'll see all the rats and the snakes and spiders "'and things begin to feel worried about you and come.' "'and they'll just fairly swarm over you "'and have a noble good time. "'Yes, they will, I reckon, Mars Tom. "'But what kind of time is Jim having? "'Bless if I can see the point. "'But I'll do it if I got to. "'I reckon I better keep the animal satisfied "'and not have no trouble in the house.' "'Tom waited to think it over "'and see if there weren't nothing else, "'and pretty soon he says, "'Oh, there's one thing I forgot.' "'Could you raise a flower here, do you reckon?' "'I don't know, but maybe I could, Mars Tom. "'But it's tolerable dark in here, "'and I ain't got no use for no flower, no how, "'and she'd be a powerful side of trouble. "'Well, you try it anyway. "'Some other prisoners has done it. "'One of them big cattail-looking mullein stalks "'are growing here, Mars Tom, I reckon, "'but she wouldn't be worth half the trouble she'd cost. "'Don't you believe it.' We'll fetch you a little one, and you plant it in the corner over there and raise it. And don't call it mullen, call it pitchiola. That's its right name when it's in a prison. And you want to water it with your tears. Why, I got plenty spring water, Mars Tom. You don't want spring water. You want to water it with your tears. It's the way they always do. Why, Mars Tom, I lay I can raise one or them mullen stalks twice with spring water, "'while's another man's a startin' one with tears. "'That ain't the idea. "'You got to do it with tears. "'She'll die on my hands, Mars Tom. "'She surely will, "'cause I don't scarcely ever cry.' "'So Tom was stumped, "'but he studied it over, "'and then said Jim would have to worry along "'the best he could with an onion. "'He promised he would go to the nigger cabins "'and drop one, private, "'in Jim's coffee pot in the morning.' Jim said he would just as soon have tobacco in his coffee, and found so much fault with it, and with the work and bother of raising the mullen, and Jews harping the rats, and petting and flattering up the snakes and spiders and things, on top of all the other work he had to do on pens and inscriptions and journals and things, which made it more trouble and worry and responsibility to be a prisoner than anything he ever undertook, that Tom most lost all patience with him, 
"'and said he was just loading down with more gaudier chances "'than a prisoner ever had in the world to make a name for himself, "'and yet he didn't know enough to appreciate them, "'and they was just about wasted on him. "'So Jim, he was sorry, and said he wouldn't behave so no more, "'and then me and Tom shoved for bed. "'End of chapter 38「Chapter thirty nine In the morning we went up to the village and bought a wire rat trap and fetched it down and unstopped the best rat hole, and in about an hour we had fifteen of the bulliest kind of ones, and then we took it and put it in a safe place under Aunt Sally's bed. But while we was gone for spiders, little Thomas Franklin Benjamin Jefferson Alexander Phelps found it there and opened the door of it to see if the rats would come out. And they did, and Aunt Sally she come in, and when we got back, she was a standin on top of the bed, raisin cane, and the rats was doin what they could to keep off the dull times for her. So she took and dusted us both with the hickory, and we was as much as two hours catchin another fifteen or sixteen drat that meddlesome cub, and they weren't the likeliest nother because the first haul was the pick of the flock. I never see a likelier lot of rats than what that first haul was. We got a splendid stock of sorted spiders and bugs and frogs and caterpillars and one thing or another, and we liked to got a hornet's nest, but we didn't. The family was at home. We didn't give it right up, but stayed with them as long as we could because we allowed we'd tire them out, or they'd got to tire us out, and they done it. Then we got Allie Cumpain and rubbed on the places and was pretty near all right again. "'but couldn't set down convenient. "'And so we went for the snakes "'and grabbed a couple of dozen garters and house snakes "'and put them in a bag and put it in our room. "'And by that time it was supper time "'and a rattling good honest day's work. "'And hungry? Oh, no, I reckon not. "'And there weren't a blessed snake up there when we went back. "'We didn't half tie the sack, "'and they worked out somehow and left. "'But it didn't matter much "'because they was still on the premises somewheres.' "'so we judged we could get some of them again. "'No, there weren't no real scarcity of snakes about the house for a considerable spell. "'You'd see them dripping from the rafters and places every now and then, "'and they generally landed in your plate or down the back of your neck, "'and most of the time where you didn't want them. "'Well, they was handsome and striped, and there weren't no harm in a million of them, "'but that never made no difference to Aunt Sally. "'She despised snakes, be the breed what they might, "'and she couldn't stand them no way you could fix it.' And every time one of them flopped down on her, it didn't make no difference what she was doing. She would just lay that work down and light out. I never see such a woman. And you could hear her whoop to Jericho. You couldn't get her to take a hold of one of them with the tongs. And if she turned over and found one in bed, she would scramble out and lift a howl that you would think the house was afire. She disturbed the old man so that he said he could most wish there hadn't ever been no snakes created. Why, after every last snake had been gone clear out of the house for as much as a week, Aunt Sally weren't over it yet. She weren't near over it. When she was settin' thinkin' about something, you could touch her on the back of her neck with a feather, and she would jump right out of her stockings. It was very curious. But Tom said all women was just so. He said they was made that way for some reason or other. We got a lickin' every time one of our snakes come in her way, "'and she allowed these lickings weren't nothing to what she would do "'if we ever loaded up the place again with them. "'I didn't mind the lickings, because they didn't amount to nothing, "'but I minded the trouble we had to lay in another lot. "'But we got them laid in, and all the other things, "'and you never see a cabin as blithesome as Jim's was "'when they'd all swarm out for music and go for him. "'Jim didn't like the spiders, and the spiders didn't like Jim, "'and so they'd lay for him and make it mighty warm for him.' "'and he said that between the rats and the snakes and the grindstone "'there weren't no room in bed for him, scarcely. "'When there was, a body couldn't sleep, it was so lively, "'and it was always lively,' he said, "'because they never all slept at one time, but took turn about. "'So when the snakes was asleep, the rats was on deck, "'and when the rats turned in, the snakes come on watch. "'So we always had one gang under him in his way, "'and the other gang having a circus over him.' "'and if he got up to hunt a new place, "'the spiders would take a chance at him as he crossed over. "'He said if he ever got out this time, "'he wouldn't ever be a prisoner again. 
"'Not for a salary.' "'Well, by the end of three weeks everything was in pretty good shape. "'The shirt was sent in early, in a pie, "'and every time a rat bit Jim he would get up and write a little in his journal "'whilst the ink was fresh. "'The pens was made, the inscriptions and so on was all carved on the grindstone. "'The bed leg was sawed in two and we had ed up the sawdust, "'and it give us a most amazing stomach ache. "'We reckoned we was all going to die, but didn't.' It was the most undigestible sawdust I ever see, and Tom said the same. But, as I was saying, we got all the work done now at last, and we was all pretty much fagged out, too, but mainly Jim. The old man had rode a couple of times to the plantation below Orleans to come and get their runaway nigger, but Han got no answer, because there weren't no such plantation. So he allowed he would advertise Jim in the St. Louis and New Orleans papers, and when he mentioned the St. Louis ones, it give me the cold shivers, and I see we hadn't no time to lose. So Tom said, Now for the anonymous letters. What's them? I says. Warnings to the people that something is up. Sometimes it's done one way, sometimes another, but there's always somebody spying around that gives notice to the governor of the castle. When Louis XVI was going to light out of the Tuileries, a servant girl done it. It's a very good way, and so is the anonymous letters. We'll use them both, and it's usual for the prisoner's mother to change clothes with him, and she stays in, and he slides out in her clothes. We'll do that, too. But look -a here, Tom, what do we want to warn anybody for that something's up? Let them find it out for themselves. It's their lookout. Yes, I know, but you can't depend on them. It's the way they've acted from the very start, left us to do everything. They're so confiding and mullet-headed, they don't take notice of nothing at all. So if we don't give them notice, there won't be nobody nor nothing to interfere with us. And so after all our hard work and trouble, this escape will go off perfectly flat. Won't amount to nothing. Won't be nothing to it. Well, as for me, Tom, that's the way I'd like. Shucks, he says, and looked disgusted. So I says, but I ain't going to make no complaint. Any way that suits you suits me. What you going to do about the servant girl? You'll be her. You slide in in the middle of the night and hook that yaller girl's frock. Why, Tom, that'll make trouble next morning, because of course you probably ain't got any but that one. I know, but you don't want it but fifteen minutes to carry the anonymous letter and shove it under the front door. All right, then, I'll do it, but I could carry it just as handy in my own togs. You wouldn't look like a servant girl then, would you? No, but there won't be nobody to see what I look like anyway. That ain't got nothing to do with it. The thing for us to do is just to do our duty and not worry about whether anybody sees us do it or not. Ain't you got no principle at all? All right, I ain't saying nothing. I'm the servant girl. Who's Jim's mother? I'm his mother. I'll hook a gown from Aunt Sally. Well, then, you'll have to stay in the cabin when me and Jim leaves. Not much. I'll stuff Jim's clothes full of straw and lay it on his bed to represent his mother in disguise, and Jim will take the nigger woman's gown off of me and wear it, and we'll all evade together. When a prisoner of style escapes, it's called an evasion. It's always called so when a king escapes, for instance. And the same with a king's son. It don't make no difference whether he's a natural one or an unnatural one. So Tom, he wrote the anonymous letter, and I smouched the yaller wench's frock that night, and put it on, and shoved it under the front door the way Tom told me to. It said, Beware, trouble is brewing. Keep a sharp lookout. Unknown friend. Next night, we stuck a picture, which Tom drawed in blood, of a skull and crossbones on the front door, and next night another one of a coffin on the back door. I never see a family in such a sweat. They couldn't have been worse scared if the place had been full of ghosts laying for them behind everything and under the beds and shivering through the air. If a door banged, Aunt Sally, she jumped and said, Ouch, if anything fell. She jumped and said, Ouch, if you happened to touch her. When she weren't noticing, she'd done the same. She couldn't face snow way and be satisfied, because she allowed there was something behind her every time. So she was always a whirling around sudden and saying, Ouch! and before she got two-thirds around, she'd whirl back again and say it again, and she was afraid to go to bed, but she doesn't set up. 
"'So the thing was working very well,' Tom said. "'He said he never seen a thing work more satisfactory. "'He said it showed it was done right. "'So, he said, now for the grand bulge. "'So the very next morning at the streak of dawn, "'we got another letter ready, "'and was wondering what we better do with it. "'Because we heard them say at supper "'they was going to have a nigger on watch at both doors all night. "'Tom, he went down the lightning rod to spy around, "'and the nigger at the back door was asleep.' "'and he stuck it in the back of his neck and come back. "'This letter said, "'Don't betray me. I wish to be your friend. "'There's a desperate gang of cutthroats from over in the Indian Territory "'going to steal your runaway nigger tonight, "'and they have been trying to scare you "'so as you will stay in the house and not bother them. "'I am one of the gang, but have got religion, "'and wish to quit it and lead an honest life again, "'and will betray the hellish design.' They will sneak down from Northards along the fence at midnight exact with a false key and go in the nigger's cabin to get him. I am to be off a piece and blow a tin horn if I see any danger, but stead of that I will baa like a sheep as soon as they get in and not blow at all. Then whilst they are getting his chains loose, you slip there and lock them in and can kill them at your leisure. Don't do anything but just the way I am telling you. If you do, they will suspicion something, and raise whoop jamboree who. I do not wish any reward, but to know I have done the right thing. Unknown friend. End of chapter thirty nine.